you. Good to see you all this morning. I'd like to invite you to turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. And as we begin to deal with some very pointed applications of what it means to be risen with Christ. But please pray with me before we look into our text. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is like a mirror to us. Lord, I pray that you would reveal areas in our lives that need to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And may the text weigh heavily on us for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a simple question to begin with, like, how powerful is the gospel? Really, like, how powerful is the gospel? Don't we sometimes fall into the trap, sometimes, into thinking that the gospel is merely a message to be believed or a message that introduces a new set of principles and rules in which to live by, but not really believing that the gospel has the power to change us from the inside out. And it's precisely because of this thinking, this thinking that the gospel saves us from sin, but doesn't give us power over our sin, that we find a powerless Christianity, a form of Christianity that has no power to help us from our sin, no power to help us with our relationships, no power to help us with the real world. And instead of realizing we have died in Christ, we are now alive in Him, instead of looking to Christ because we have been raised, Instead of seeking things that are above where Christ is, we look elsewhere for help. We look elsewhere for satisfaction. We look elsewhere for fullness. We look to earthly solutions and alternatives that offer no good. Now, I want to give you a contemporary modern example um, and compare it to the times in which the Colossians lived in, just so you can see how timely this passage is for us and how it matters for us today. You know, the the great war cry of our time today is equality for all. And discrimination and injustice, you know, equal rights for everyone, right? Like we've all we've all heard this. And this is good, right? This is a noble task. Because do we see injustice today? Yes, we do. Do we see discrimination today? Yes. Do we see men taking advantage of women? Absolutely. Do we see husbands abusing their authority over their wives? Yes, 100%. And do we see parents abusing their children, neglecting their children, not loving them? Yes. And, you know, just even within the the month that I've been here, I've heard stories and it saddens my heart. But we see the effect of sin. And what people tend to do is to abolish all these things, right? Get rid of the difference between men and women. Get rid or rewrite traditional marriage roles. Or rethink how much authority parents should have over their children. And and if you think about it, it sounds really tempting, doesn't it? And it sometimes might even sound practical. I mean, if you remove the system, if you remove the structures in which the abuse happens in the first place, then maybe that will solve the problem, right? But no. These are all smoke and mirrors to deflect from the real problem. Because we need to remind ourselves that, biblically speaking, marriage is good. The difference between men and women are good. Parents are good for children. Why? Because God created these relationships. If we are happy to say 
that Jesus created all things, as we look at in chapter 1, then that means as he is the head over all creation, then he has the say as to how things are supposed to operate, right, in his world. And so getting rid of all these relationships is not addressing the root issue. You know, the cause of all these issues and problems is that society has not, society will not, and cannot, apart from Christ, put to death whatever belongs to their earthly nature. Right? Like, it's, it's a social commentary, isn't it? Society loves their sin too much. They don't want to put to death everything that belongs to their earthly nature. And as a result, we see what our society has become. And sin tra- transcends culture, doesn't it? Sin transcends time. Because Paul was in a similar situation, right? Paul was writing to real people. Paul was writing to people with real problems who experience real discrimination, real oppression, and real injustice, and probably in ways that we don't understand today, right? But his solution to restore equality was not to abolish marriage. His solution was not for kids to revolt against their parents or even abolish slavery, which I will clarify this once we get to to this section. His solution to restoring these relationships was found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. His solution was to point people to Jesus and to persuade them that in Christ, they have what they need in order to find forgiveness from their sin debt and therefore can have a love for all God's people to live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, to be fully mature in Christ, to have the riches of complete understanding, everything that a person needs in this life to relate well with one another, to truly restore broken relationships. And what was it that they received that would enable them to live in this way? We looked at it last week, didn't we? new life in Christ. Since they had been raised with Christ, since they had been given a new nature, a new father, a new master, they were to operate under a new general principle that should govern every single area of their lives. And what was that principle? Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that in Christ, through the power of the gospel, they can find restoration. They can restore these beautiful, God-ordained relationships, being, despite being horrifically marred and abused by sinful men and women. So in our text, Paul addresses three relationships that were within the common household of his day. And that is the husband-wife relationship, the parent and child or children relationship and the master and slave relationship. So firstly, let's look at the husband and wife relationship. Just for some background, I want to read a quote from a historian or a theologian named William Barclay. He said this regarding uh, the, the women in those times and reading, under Jewish law, a woman was a thing. She was the possession of her husband, just as much as his house or his flocks or his material goods were. She had no legal right whatsoever. For instance, under Jewish law, a husband could divorce his wife for any cause, while a wife had no rights whatever in the initiation of divorce. From her, there was demanded a complete servitude and chastity, but her husband could go out as much as he chose and could enter into as many relationships outside marriage as he liked and incur no stigma. Both under Jewish and under Greek laws and custom, all the privileges belong to the husband and all the duties to the wife. This is what Paul was writing to. To society, this was normal, expected even, and systemic and beyond saving, if, if we put in our, our, our modern thinking. 
beyond saving, which makes the first command a little bit counterintuitive for Christian wives, right? Verse 18, what, what was Paul's instruction to the wives? Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And this is important, as is fitting in the Lord. As we progress through all these different relationships, the standard is what is right before God. Not society, but before God. So Paul here appeals to God's created order. They are to submit because that is what is fitting in the Lord. Or in other words, that is by nature how God designed the wife's role in marriage. And unfortunately, the word submit, right, or submission has become a negative word in our day and age. It's taboo. You know, the world sees submission as oppression. But within the household of God, it's seen as order. The world sees order and a hierarchy as concepts that need to be torn down, but within God's household, there is beauty in order and hierarchy. Now, the world sees order and hierarchy as constructs that promote abuse, but within God's household, order and hierarchy are avenues in which we can show selfless love. But we need to be very clear here. Biblical submission does not mean inferiority. Right? We, look, we can look to Jesus. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father, yet they are equal. The Holy Spirit proceeds from Christ, yet they are equal. In fact, before Paul calls wives to submit their husbands in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 5 is a parallel passage here. In verse 21, before he dives into his instruction to the family, he says this, Ephesians 5.21, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This simply means that every spirit-filled Christian must be humble and submissive. None of this toxic masculinity, toxic feminism business that we're hearing so much about today. But that doesn't negate the fact that God has a design for husbands and wives. No, we can look to Ephesians 5.23 and see clearly a God-created order. Let me just read that for you. Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. But it must be said, because it has been abused. Biblical submission is voluntary. It is something on the behalf of the wife that they are supposed to give out of their own volition. It should never be coerced and forced. I mean, to the children and the slaves, the command was to obey, right? There's this idea that when something is said, you must just do it. But to the wives, it is to submit. And there is a difference here. You know, you shouldn't expect your wives to submit to you in the same way you expect your children to obey you. And submission has its limits. You know, a wife can and should refuse to submit if their husbands are causing them to sin, causing them to violate God's commands or if harm is being inflicted. We must obey God rather than men. You know, unfortunately, and you've probably heard this as well, you've heard people abuse this verse, telling their wives, you must submit to me because of this. That's wrong. It's sinful and must be put away. You, you just need to read the next verse, right? Husbands, love your wives to find out that this isn't for selfish reasons. It isn't a free pass for husbands to treat their wives as lesser. You see, for a Christian, submission is not a question of worth or value. Every single person has been created in the image of God. So we are of equal worth and value. But it is a question of God-given roles. Christians, we need to understand that God created men and women different. We were made differently. And we are to value these differences, right? Because it's, it's these differences, it, it's these differences in how we think and how we're made that allows us to complement each other beautifully. You know, that's, that's why we say mushy stuff to our wives, right? Like, oh, you complete me. Or, 
You're my better half, right? None of the husbands are smiling. <laughs> and, and actually, it, it doesn't mean, submission also doesn't mean that wives have no say in the relationship. Actually, depending on who they marry, some men can be real bozos, <laughs> to, put, to put lightly, that their wives should probably be given more say in the relationship. But submission does mean that husbands have the responsibility to have the final say and that they are accountable to God for that decision. As the head of the home, the father is accountable to God for how he leads his family. But before we move on to the husbands, as I was going through this and I was, as I was studying, there's always edge cases here, isn't there, that this text doesn't quite cover. You know, what about, what about if I have an unbelieving husband? What does that look like? Well, I'd like to read a passage, and I must diverge here for a little bit, in, from 1 Peter chapter 3. If you want to turn there with me, I'd like to read from verses 1 to 5, which I think will be an encouragement for those who find themselves in this situation. 1 Peter 3, 1 says this, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. If your husband is not saved, but yet treats you in a way that is, you know, in step with God's laws, the best thing that you can do is submit to him. To live lives of purity and reverence, to live a life that reflects the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, you may not be able to win them using words right now, but your lives speak volumes. Submission speaks volumes. And in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, it says this, For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Christian wives are literally a blessing to their husbands. You know, you being a Christian, praying for them, living a godly life puts them in a position of privilege and blessing you know when you prosper they prosper and as we read in first peter 3 as they watch you and your life they are more likely to come to christ and we can praise god for that now let's move on to the husbands verse 19 husbands are to love their wives Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. You know, within this new Christian paradigm, the husbands are called to radically shift their views towards their wives. You know, while other men were abusing their wives through their words and through their actions, while other men, husbands, were committing adultery openly, right, without the risk of social stigma, Paul commands Christian husbands to love their wives, to see them as equals, to no longer recognize them or to see them as merely objects, but as image bearers of God, recognizing their worth and value. And they are to love them, not just with a, a sensual love or with a brotherly or sisterly love, but with a self-sacrificing love, a selfless love, a love that transcends feelings, a love that transcends emotions, a love that transcends 
circumstances with this general command to love bears so many specific implications, doesn't it? It means in everything you do, as you, as you think through decisions, you know, apart from asking the question first, will this glorify God? We need to ask the question, will this be helpful for my wife? And you actually go to her, like you talk to her, get her opinion on things, discuss it, talk it through. You know, biblical submission doesn't mean that wives shouldn't influence you or have their say. If, you're, if your wife has ideas, one way to love her is to listen to her. And it is for the good, if it's for the good of the family, you, you have to do it. None of this my way or the highway business. Husbands, you can show love for your wives by putting their interests above your own. If your wife thinks you shouldn't drink any more Coke and go full water, you do that. If, you think, if she thinks it's good for you to stop the meat, eat the veggies, eat the veggies and pray for your wife. <laughs> Similarly, Peter says to the husbands in that same passage we just read in 1 Peter 3, in verse 7, says this to the husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your own wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, not inferior, just weaker phys physically, and as heirs with you. That, that shows equality. Heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Treat them with respect. What does that mean? What does it mean to treat your wives with respect? It means don't be harsh with them. Don't rule them as an overbearing tyrant. Watch what you say and the famous phrase, not just what you say, but how you say it as well. You know, how many careless words said in the most careless ways have we given to our wives without even thinking about it? How many times have we, without thinking, criticized our wives for what they forgot to do without even realizing all the thousand things that they've done that we just haven't seen? But instead of being harsh, be gentle towards them, respect them, be faithful to them. Don't give your attention to another that is, that is reserved for your wife. Give them the affection, the care, provision, protection, and the assistance that they deserve. Pray for them, lead them spiritually. Take the time to, to talk about spiritual things with your wives. Lead them spiritually. This is what it means. This is just scratching the surface about what it means to really love our wives. And we're supposed to, to do all these things just because God has commanded us. But there is a practical aspect to this, isn't it? Isn't it easier for a wife to submit to a husband who loves them, right? No doubt the passages we looked at last week concerning you know, the sexual and relational sins would have hit the men right in between the eyes. And it reminded them of their responsibility towards their wives and children. You know, the husbands of Paul's day thought they had all the privileges and none of the responsibility. And doesn't that sound like most husbands say? <laughs> all the privileges, none of the responsibility. But in Christ, a Christian husband actually has been called to a higher standard, a higher level of responsibility. Wives are called to submit to their husbands, submit their, their strong opinions, submit how they think things should be done, but husbands are commanded to willingly give their lives, to lay their lives aside for their own wives. Husbands especially need to be reminded that he and his wife are no longer two separate entities, but one. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, He who loves his wife loves himself. Why? After all, no one hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. How should you love and care for your wife? The same way we care and love for our own selves. You know, Paul's call to submit and love are not reciprocal in the sense that you must only submit 
if your husband loves you, or you must only love if your wife submits to you. Husbands must love, regardless of whether your wife submits or not. Wives must submit, even if your husband doesn't show biblical love. But they are reciprocal in the sense that if you want to enjoy the fullness of God, of God's plan for the husband and wife relationship in marriage, then we must abide by God's design for marriage. So biblical love and biblical submission goes hand in hand. And there is a promise of blessing there. Paul then shifts to another family dynamic, and that's the relationship between children and their parents. Now, similar to the wife, children under Roman law had pretty much no rights. You know, the father could do anything he wanted to do with his children. He could sell them, he could turn them into slaves, even take their lives. This was the sad plight of the the society that Paul found himself in. And inevitably, right, this would cause children to view their children, oh sorry, children to view their parents in a negative and in sometimes a hostile way. I mean, you even think about it in the modern context. You think about parents who have treated their children poorly. What does that do to them? Right? How does that affect them? But nevertheless, Paul calls children who have become Christians to a higher standard. Verse 20, what are they to do? Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. No, this word children is, is a broad word. There's no age limit. It refers to a child who is dependent on their parents. So basically, as long as you're at home, as long as your parents are providing for you, you have one command to obey your parents in everything. Now, this is not anything new, you know, it's it's all over the Old Testament. In fact, disobedience to parents in the Old Testament was considered to be such a serious sin that if a child was unrepentant, that's the key operative word, they would have been guilty of the death penalty. And disobedience was as bad as witchcraft and stubbornness as idolatry, that's serious isn't it? And one of the reasons why it's, this, why it's this way is because children who disobey their parents are rejecting the authority in which God has placed in their lives. And disobeying parents is, in a way, disobeying God. Now, notice the reason why children are to obey their parents. Because it's pleasing to God. Or as Ephesians 6 1 says, because it is right. This is God's standard. This is His design for all children. You know, when you obey your parents' children, you're obeying God. And when you disobey your parents, you're disobeying God. And that's sin. But children, also, did you know that obeying your parents is a grace from God? Now, this may come as a shock to you. There are a few kids here, and I being a kid once, it may shock you. But kids don't know everything. I know, it took me a while to get over that. (laughs) But God in His grace has placed parents in your lives, in our lives, for precisely that reason to teach us, to teach you about God, to teach you about life, to teach you about what is right and what is wrong. And I'll let you in on another secret. Your parents actually know what you're going through. They've been there. It may not look the same, but they've been there. They know the struggles that you're facing. They know the, the longings that you are longing after. Nothing is new under the sun. The struggles you face, they've faced. And children, we need to remind ourselves this, that in the throes of, of the arguments and the butting of heads, our parents actually love you more than they 
more than you know. And obeying them, listen children, obeying your parents could save you from a lifetime of hurt. You know, Sinclair Ferguson, a Presbyterian pastor, refers to the fifth commandment, that is to honor your parents, as a kindly, stern policeman who looks over you to ensure that you don't commit all the other, all, all the other sins contained within the Ten Commandments. Their special role is to keep children from sin and spiritual danger. It's okay to not know everything. Right? You're still growing, still learning. We're all still learning, and that's part of the process. But that's why God gave you parents to protect you from sin, to protect you from others, but even to protect you from yourselves. Now you may ask, now what if my parents aren't Christians or are not walking with God? The command still applies. It's still the right thing to do. God gave you to your parents not by accident, right? And this is a universal rule. And because this is, as I keep saying, by God's design, children are to obey their parents in all things. But with the usual caveats, right? As long as the parents aren't violating God's standards, his laws, or causing harm. Now another edge case. Now you may think, this doesn't apply to me. I'm all grown up, right? I, I buy my own food. I can buy whatever I want. Well, the fifth commandment still applies to you, doesn't it? All right? You are to honor your father and mother. The relationship may change. You may have your own home. You may have your own life. But what remains the same is that they are still your parents, and we are still their children. And though they may not have the same level of authority over you by just the virtue of the fact that you are no longer under their authority, or you're no longer depending on them, you are still to honor them. You are, to, you are still to listen to them, take them seriously, and take into consideration what they have to say. You may not agree with everything that they have to say, but at least give them the time of day to listen to what they have to say and consider it. That's what it means to honor your parents. But as with all other commands, very quickly, parents have a responsibility as well. Verse 21, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. You know, there's a special application to fathers here because of their relationship they can have with their kids. But the word father here can also mean parent in a general sense. So I'll just apply this broadly. You know, parents are not to embitter, that is to frustrate or to provoke their children unless they become discouraged. As children are to obey willingly in everything, parents also are to lead them, nurture them, Discipline them in such a way that it doesn't provoke them to anger, as the King James Version says. Quite literally, the word embitter means to irritate. Stop irritating your children or they will become discouraged. Usually it's the other way around, isn't it? Well, how can parents irritate their children? Plenty of ways. All right, I'm sure the kids can <laughs> probably give their own, they can add to this list, but I'll give you a few ways. Parents can be overprotective. They can be underprotective. They can show favoritism. They can demean them, discourage them, not showing them love, not encouraging to them, not providing for their needs, and over-disciplining them. I'm sure you can add more to this list, right? But there are just some ideas if you need help. Um, <laughs> frustrating your children. Parents are not to be overbearing to their children. Now this asks the question, does that mean that I don't discipline them? Absolutely not. It means you discipline them. I mean, Proverbs 13, 24 says, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. If anything, the best thing you can do to your children, the most loving thing you can do for your children is to discipline them, to bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord, as Ephesians 6, 4 says, and this includes discipline. And the Lord himself patterns discipline for us, doesn't he? Right? Hebrews 12, 6 says that as a loving father, he disciplines us, not that he hates us, but because he loves us. 
and he chastens everyone he accepts as sons. And as children, we are to willingly accept God's discipline. Why? Because, Hebrews 12, 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. God lovingly disciplines us so that it may produce good fruits, peace, righteousness in our lives. So too, parents must exercise loving discipline, patient discipline towards their children for the same reason. You know, par- children, when your parents are disciplining you and you know they are doing it out of a love for God and a love for you, what is the right thing to do? Receive it. Receive it because it's a sign that they actually love you and they care for you and they want you to not commit avoidable mistakes in your lives. And overall, they want you to please God. And to be honest, they are probably hurting more than you know. But they love you so much and they care enough for you to correct you, even though it hurts them. But parents at the same time must work hard to create an atmosphere which make not only discipline but obedience easy and natural. This also applies to those who are caring for children. They may not be your kids, but if you are responsible for them, this applies to you as well. Well, it looks like that we won't have time to to go through the rest of our text today, so we'll pick this up next week. But I, and you may have heard this as well, I don't need to be a Christian to do these things. Or perhaps you know families who aren't Christians that look like the textbook family. Or you you know Christians who are supposed to embody these principles, but yet they do not. And the response to that is, well, that's good, right? Because when people follow God's commands, he's got this common grace on us, that when we obey God's commands, when we abide by his design and principles, then everything will fall into place. But it changes for a Christian. As I said last week, we don't obey these commands to be Christians. It's precisely because we are Christians that we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The new man is being renewed in the knowledge of God. And so we're not doing it to prove a point. We're doing it because we love God. It is for God, because it's fitting for God. That's the difference. And so may that be the the motivation why we love our wives, submit to our husbands, obey our parents, and, and treat our kids with as much patience and encouragement and kindness as much as possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for the Spirit of God that dwells in our lives, that changes us, that gives us a new nature, that's able to take an angry person and turn him into a loving person, who is able to take a selfish person and turn him into a selfless person, a hateful person, into a loving person. Thank you for the Spirit. and Only through the Spirit can we live by the Spirit. Only through the Spirit that we can obey your laws. But help us to do so for your glory. Help us to do all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.